on without it. I'm so sorry. I'm, we're getting a new computer next month in here. Yay, 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 yay. Okay, your pulse rate is going to be the number of times that your heart beats in one minute. Pulse rate is always going to be based on 60 seconds. Pulse rate is going to be variable. Uh, older people tend to have faster heart rates than younger people. People in better shape usually have, you know, a slower heart rate than, you know, people that are maybe not so healthy. So it's going to really vary. So it's nice to find out if a patient happens to know what their normal heart rate is. Some do. They've called 911 a lot. The range is going to be from 60 to 100. Anything below 60 is considered what? The B word? Bradycardia. B-R-A-D-Y. Bradycardia. If it's over 100, we call it tachycardia. So you need to be familiar with the terminology. So anything in between there is okay. Of course, that's kind of relative too. Say you have a patient that's on uh, blood pressure medication to keep his blood pressure down. Uh, and that may also depress his heart rate. So if you had an older guy who had a blood pressure of 68, <coughs> is that good or bad? It could be okay. It could be a bad sign for him if he's normally closer to 100. So you gotta also look at the bigger picture of your patient. Above 120 or below 50, these are important cutoffs too. If your patient's got a pulse above 120, then it's really going to compromise the feeling of the heart. So if you've got a patient with a uh, who's tachycardic at say 116, is that really a really big deal? What can make your heart rate go up to 115 or 16? Do what? Yeah, if you're exercising or if you're scared, you know that may be a normal process where you become a little bit tachycardic. If you're at 130 or 140, it's not that you're just scared anymore. You've got something going on, and it's not good for you. Same thing, if it falls below 50, you're in a pretty serious state. Your body's not able to perfuse itself very well. So above 120 and below 50, you've got serious problems. At 120, it's not able to fill. At just 50, it's not able to get enough blood circulating. Yes? How long does it take for a pulse to Oh, it's pretty fast. Yeah, it's real fast because there's blood right there. You're not waiting on it to move. So if you put it on here, you're reading the blood that's actually in that finger at that time. So within a few seconds, it should it should acclimate. Have you had a problem with one not working? Uh, I just we had somebody that their heart rate was just you know, they were just putting that just in their house. Yeah, if behind it was if it. it's um, if they're poorly perfused, then it's not ever going to be accurate. Or if they're cold, vasoconstricted, it won't be accurate. You know, a lot of things will interfere with the accuracy, but if it's really regular, the pulse is really regular, uh, your pulse oximeter is there checking the, the amount of oxygen on the hemoglobin, but it's also checking the pulse. So if it's really irregular, sometimes it has a hard time zeroing in because it's trying to do two things at once. So it may not zero in on a pulse so quickly. It may take it a while to acclimate, but usually that's because the pulse is irregular or if your battery's dying, and that's not uncommon. Okay, in which of these settings would tachycardia be normal? Look, polling's open. You can vote. Let's do it, guys. I think I must only have about, what, 20 clickers or 18? I have to remember to get some more. You can change your answer if you got it wrong. There's 16 responses. I think I have more than 16. Did everybody vote? Anybody sleeping? Okay, let's see. Oh, food. <laughs> it's supposed to be a countdown timer. I thought I erased most of them. I must have missed one. Sorry. Should have hit that first. Ta da! <gasps> everybody got it right! <laughs> Woohoo! Give yourselves a hand! Okay, you got two things that really determine uh, your pulse quality. The rhythm and the force. What's the rhythm? Regular or irregular, yeah. And most of the time we like them to be regular, right? And what's the force? Yeah, how hard. And that represents how hard the left ventricle is contracting. So if you have a really hard 
pulse. We call that a full pulse. We see that with certain disorders. We see that so if your patient's hyperthermic, it's going to increase that pulse because it's trying to get more blood to the skin. So we're looking at rhythm and force. That will determine the quality of the pulse. Like if somebody's real shocky, we might say that their pulse is weak and thready. And that difference looks like this. Draw it here. So weak and thready kind of looks like this. Sometimes you might have a patient that has a bounding pulse, and it looks like this. So here you can see where the middle of that pulse is, can't you? You can feel that when it passes. It's like a giant wave in the ocean. Here, these are just little rolling waves in the ocean, and it's hard to tell where the top point of that pulse is. So this is representing a left ventricle that's just going whoosh, and this one's kind of going whoosh. I don't have enough blood in here. I don't have enough energy. So bounding pulse and weak thready pulse. Okay, regularity. Most patients have a regular pulse. I say most. Probably 10 to 15 percent of your patients will have an irregular pulse. Some patients have just a regularly irregular pulse, meaning it's always irregular. So you might ask a patient, you know, uh, do you have an irregular pulse? Yeah, it's always irregular. We see irregular pulse much more commonly in our elderly population. They get something called atrial fibrillation, uh, which is very common in older people, and it kind of gives them a, you know, irregular pulse there. So just because it's irregular, that doesn't mean that they're about to have a heart attack. It may be normal for them. In some cases, an irregular pulse may indicate that there's a problem, but sometimes not so much. The uh, pulse force, this is just what I was talking about I drew on the board. Is it weak and thready or is it a bounding pulse, a full pulse? Common pulse locations. I mentioned the radial. Who do we uh, check a brachial pulse on? Yeah, babies. B is for brachial, that's right. C, carotid, is going to be for children and adults. Let's see, I think we have a question here. Is this going to count now, too? No, go back. Okay, where should you check a pulse on a conscious adult? Don't say the answer. Now, come on now. We're running out of time. We got a few that haven't voted yet. Go ahead and figure out how it works. <laughs> Answer is radial pulse. If they're conscious, I mean, if you're, if I'm coming in here to my patient Dalton and I'm saying, how are you doing today? Let me check your pulse. And I'll like grab him on the neck. What's he going to do? Ah, help me, help me. Yeah, if they're conscious, do them a favor, just kind of grab them at the wrist, feel their pulse. Don't scare me. Okay. I already told you that. Radial pulse. When you feel the radial pulse, now I noticed last night some of you guys were checking the pulse on the long spine board, not on the board, but on the patient on the board. Uh, when you check a radial pulse, uh, don't check it with your thumb. you got to check it with your fingers. And when you feel it, spread your fingers out across the bone first. And then you'll feel it somewhere along those three fingers. And then zero in on exactly where you feel it and press there. Okay. If you're trying to go like this, you're not going to find it. Same thing here. If you're going like this, you're not going to find it. So spread your fingers out until you locate it and then zero in. Same thing if you're having to do the carotid. You know, you lay your fingers out when you feel it and kind of zero in on it so you can get your fingertip on there. But don't, don't do it with your thumb. And remember, the radial side is going to be on the thumb side. And start practicing that on other people, not just yourself. The brachial pulse, we're going to check on babies under a year. And it's going to be on the upper arm. And when you check this, here again, you've got to press that artery against the bone. You're not going to get it like this. You're going to have to spread your fingers out like this. 
And if you can feel it, which you probably won't be able to very well, but if you feel it, then zero in on it and try to palpate it. It's hard to feel on adults. You've got too much tissue in there. With little kids, it's much, babies, it's muscles. much easier. They don't have any muscles. What? Too many muscles? Yeah. All right, just told you that. Okay, carotid pulse, feel along the large carotid artery on either side of the neck. Now, you can check a carotid pulse. We've got a carotid artery on one on each side of the neck. And let me caution you, don't go like this, whether they're conscious or unconscious, because if, if especially if he's already unconscious and I go like this, what's going to happen? Yeah, I cut off the blood flow to the head. Yeah, so he was doing bad. Now he's really doing bad. Okay, here's a question for you. Which of the following would be a serious finding? Okay, come on, a couple more. Who's sleeping out there? <laughs> come on, I know I've had 15, so who's not playing? 16? I got three people not playing. 14? We're just going to wait till everybody does it. Okay, two more. A little peer pressure? Who's not playing? I'm over it. <laughs> okay. Now, the worst thing here is that some of you picked A. <laughs> because A, what are those letters I told you A represents? You're killing me. What does that mean? Yeah, 90 is within normal limits. No one should pick that, okay? Whew. Killing me. <laughs> All right. Now, when you're counting your pulse, because you're going to have to get the pulse rate, if it's regular, you can count it for 30 seconds and multiply by 2. I know that's a math problem, but if you work on it, you can probably get there. If you palpate a pulse and you see that it is uh, 40, if we multiply by 2, what have we got? 80. 80. Right, pulse rate of 80. Now, if it's irregular or abnormal in any way, you want to go ahead and count it out for the full minute. So, if rate, rhythm, or force is not normal, count it for 60 seconds. With regard to vital signs, respiration means, when we're talking about vital signs, is movement of air in and out. We can't really judge respiration other than seeing what their skin signs are, are they perfusing. So we're just counting ventilation when we mark respirations. A respiratory rate is the number of breaths a patient takes in one minute. You should count these for a minute because the rate should be, what's the rate? Between what and what? Between 12 and 20 is normal for an adult. So yeah, you should just kind of count those out. That's one that students make a lot of mistakes on, when, or people, not just students. When you're counting respirations, just go ahead and count them out for a minute. A really good way to check vital signs on a patient would be, since I'm checking your vital signs, I'm going to say, let me check your pulse. I'm counting the pulse like this, but I'm also going to watch his chest at the same time. Or I may count his pulse for 30 seconds and then watch his chest for a minute and just barely shift my eyes and he won't notice that I'm watching his chest to watch the rise and fall. Is that funny? What, what happens here is you've got a patient that, uh, once they notice that you're counting their respirations, is that something they can alter? Yeah, they're not going to be able to alter their pulse, but they may alter their respirations, either deliberately or not. You know, they get nervous because you're counting and they start going, <laughs> or they want you to think something's wrong with them, so they do something different. So when we're documenting respirations, they're fast or slow or normal is the way we document that. Of course, we'll give it a number. Um, do I have one more on here? Oh, okay, got a question. Oh, this is a hard one. This is from your CPR book. Hey, she's going to make me read the CPR book. Hey. Your question is right off the registry. I had a student came back and said, yeah, they asked me how many times you ventilated patient once you're intubated. I don't want you to miss 
that's it. Okay, chop chop. We're here all night. You can thank your slow classmates. Come on, a couple more. Somebody's sitting on their little responder, aren't they? Oh. Oh. Let's see, I got you on this one, I can tell. Six, every six to eight seconds. Remember, once they're intubated, they've got, they've got a definitive airway. They've got an advanced airway in there. How many compressions per minute do you do, or what's the ratio of compressions once they're intubated? You don't stop. That's exactly right. You're doing chest compressions, and you're going to interpose six to eight uh, a breath every six to eight seconds. Okay, so that's going to be about 10 to 12 breaths per minute. So you're counting those off. It doesn't matter where the compressions are. You're just going to ventilate. And that's important to know because I know that's a registry question. Okay, in adults, uh, respiratory rate is 12 to 20, and different things are going to influence that. If they're in really good shape, their respiratory rate is probably going to be lower. You know, if they've just run up the stairs, it's probably going to be higher. If they're a larger person, more likely it's going to be a little bit higher. So uh, a lot of things will dictate what their normal rate is. So as long as it's within normal limits, you're okay. If it's a little bit over, you know, that's usually okay. Under starts freaking me out a little bit unless, you know, they're a marathon runner and they're breathing eight times a minute. If they look well perfused, they've got a good pulse rate, a good mental status, you know, their skin is nice and dry, the general impression is good. I'm not going to worry about some guy that, you know, weighs 120 pounds and he runs 50 miles a day. I'm probably not going to worry about his respiratory rate or his pulse rate being 48. Okay, rates above 24 should freak you out. Below 8 should freak you out. Those are serious. I say above 24. You know, that may be a little bit relative, but below 8, 8 and below definitely. In fact, we say less than 8 intubate. Okay, respiratory quality. Now, there are things you're looking for when you're assessing their respiratory status. Well, we've already talked about is it fast or slow, right? We want to know if uh, their quality is normal. That really kind of means is it silent? You know, when you're listening, can you hear them going? <sighs> that would be a bad sign, wouldn't it? If they're breathing very shallow, you know, like you can't even see the chest rise, that would be a bad sign. If it's labored, now labored doesn't necessarily mean noisy. Noisy might mean wheezing or gurgling, but labored would mean you look at them and they look like they're working hard to breathe. You know, their position is like this, you know. They've got the mouth open, you know, they look like knuckle draggers here. They may have nasal flare. You may see some uh, tension in the muscles as they're trying to breathe. They're going. Now that may be quiet breathing, but it's distressed breathing or labored breathing. Another word for that is going to be dyspnea. I hope I can spell that. Dips. No. No. I don't know. Dipsia. That means difficulty breathing. Labored breathing. Assessing respirations, you want to check the pulse and then count the respirations. You can do it all at once, uh, hopefully without your patient knowing it. You can multiply. Uh, you can do it for 30 seconds and multiply if they're breathing normally. If there's anything <coughs> abnormal, you want to go ahead and count it out for a whole minute. Note the rate, the quality, the rhythm of respiration. Most of the time, for respirations, they're going to be regular. Most of the time they're regular. There are very few things that will make them irregular. That's very different than with a pulse. It's very common for a pulse to be irregular. It's very uncommon for respirations to be irregular. Now, for instance, my respirations are irregular because I'm talking so much. I know you're saying if you'd shut up, you could breathe normally. I know. But when someone's talking, then that's going to change their respiratory pattern. Uh, a severe head injury will alter the patient's respiratory pattern. So there are just a few things that change the regular irregularity of that, or change the regularity. So, but you still want to note it. 
Skin, you know, is a vital sign. You're checking the color of the skin, the temperature, the condition of the skin. Those are the things we talked about, right? What color is it? Is it pink? Is it pale? Are they yellow? What else are we checking? Temperature. Is it warm? Is it cold? And what's condition indicate? Really, is it dry? Yeah, or is it diaphoretic? So those are things you're checking for there. When you're checking for skin color, uh, sometimes you may think that a dark-skinned person or anybody uh, with different colored skin than you have, that it's difficult to tell their skin tone, but no. Have you ever looked at a dark-skinned person and you can tell that they're pale? That sounds really weird, but you can look at them and they pale up just like anybody else. They get a nice, uh, not nice, but a, a kind of flat uh, appearance to their skin. But other places you can check, you can check the nail beds, you know, kind of like a capillary refill, but if this is really pale in their nail beds, or their lips, or their eyes, you can look in there. Uh, that will tell you if they're pale, or if it's jaundice, or if they're real pink. So there are other areas you can check besides just looking at their skin. A normal skin, yeah, we talked about all this. Make sure you know jaundice, yellow, what does that usually indicate? Problems with the liver, liver disorders. Cyanotic, kind of blue-gray, flushed. What do you think could make a patient be real flushed or red-looking? If they've been exercised, if they're overheated, those are the most common ones. We see it sometimes with uh, certain drugs we'll talk about later. Sometimes they're a little bit of fever. Yeah, we talked about heat if they're too hot. Yeah, if they're okay. feverish. <laughs> now ready? Oh, food. I already told you that one. That's no fun. I tell you too much. You miss this one when we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, there is a way I can download these results and see if you pick the wrong answer. The nursing classes, they'll do that and they actually give them a grade on it. Participation grade? Should be grade. I can do it. <laughs> Okay, skin temperature, you know, you probably don't want to check just at the fingers to check skin temperature, but if you check the torso, you know, if you put your hand, the back of your hand somewhere on their skin, you'll be able to detect very easily if they're warm, cold, hot, whatever. Kids, I already mentioned this. It says for children under six, that means what? Age what? Five and under. Okay. You do a capillary refill. We talked about. Now with the capillary refill, you're checking to see how long it takes for those capillary beds to fill back up, back up with blood. That indicates their perfusion status. If you squeeze it and it takes it like five seconds to refill, there's not getting much blood down in that area, is there? So they are poorly perfused. They're not circulating well. So you're going to evaluate the cap, cap refill or capillary <coughs> refill on little kids. Should be less than two seconds. Two seconds or less. Pupils. When you're checking pupils, I think we talked about this the other night, you should have, uh, with Greg. When pupils dilate, what type of environment are you usually in? Right. If it's really dark, your pupils are going to dilate to let more light in, right? If it's really bright in here, they're going to what? They're going to constrict. If you have a head injury, a major head injury, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're usually going to have a big one and a little one, right? Certain drugs will alter that too. Say you're on some type of narcotic, which is a depressant. Makes you like, what are your people's going to do? Okay, let's talk about the difference in the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember what I told you happens with the sympathetic nervous system? That's going to be when somebody jumps out and scares you. What happens to your body? What happens to your pupils? Your pupils dilate. Y'all with me back there? Yeah. Your pupils dilate. What else happens? Your heart rate picks up. What happens to your respiratory rate? Yeah. All that is a result of the sympathetic nervous system response. That's going to be when something uh, excites you, something stimulates you. So a narcotic does the opposite of stimulating you, right? A narcotic... What, what happens when you take a narcotic to your vital signs? What happens to the respiratory rate? It goes down. What happens to your pulse rate? It goes down. What happens to your blood pressure? What happens to your pupils? Yeah, they relax too. So, 
Some drugs are going to alter that. So if you've gotten somebody that's taken some amphetamines, what's his eyes going to look like? Me. Yeah. They're big and black and scary looking. So some patients you're going to look at them and you're going to see these giant black holes in the middle of their head, right? It's either going to be really dark in there or you better be running. When you assess the pupils, you want to check them early. It is one of your vital signs. And make sure that you just bring it in very quickly from the side and check it and move it out. Yeah. Got all that? Now, probably 10 to 15% of the population have normally irregular pupils. So you might ask your patient, if you're looking straight at them and one is just, you know, a millimeter larger than the other one, you know, and they appear to be normal in every other way, you might ask them, you know, as you check your pupils, anybody ever told you that your pupils are irregular? And yeah, I knew that. I've had several patients tell me that. Yeah, I knew that. So, okay, well, that's good. It's good to know. So don't be alarmed by it necessarily. If everything else seems normal and one's bigger than the other, there are a lot of things that can cause that. But make sure you, you check them both and you document them both. Now, what this means is don't document the patient's uh, pupils were equal and reactive to light, which is like this. I guess it's probably not the best one here. Pupils equal and reactive to light. That pupils, pupils, this is plural. I'm going to write a little S here. Both pupils are equal and reactive to light. Now what if you wrote that and you get the patient to the hospital and they check their pupils and find out the guy has a glass eye? Do you think both of his pupils have been equal and reactive to light? No. And so what are they going to think about you? Yeah. Remember that other one I said a minute ago? What does that mean? Yeah, within normal limits. It also means we never looked. And that's what they're going to say about you. Man, he said he checked his pupils. They never looked. You don't want them to say that about you. Okay. Look for the size. They big or little? Are they equal? What? <laughs> Probably. I think he's got cataract or something. It's pretty weird. And are they reactive? So you're really documenting three things here. Are they big or little? Are they reactive? And are they equal? Yeah. <coughs> Yellowness in their eyes. What causes that? Like you mean whites? around the whites? Yeah. They're probably a little bit jaundiced. Sometimes it, you can have sun damage. You know, older people in particular, they may have some yellow in there that's just sun damage. You know, they should have worn sunglasses. Of course, those probably didn't work anyway. Hey, uh, this is just a picture of what some different pupils look like. These are obviously dilated. Sometimes they'll be so dilated you can't see any color there. It's just this giant big black hole. That's real scary. Constricted. These are unequal. Uh, a word for unequal pupils. I can spell this right. Uh, Anisocoria. Get on there. Means unequal pupils. blood pressure of 120 over 80, what are we going to write about you? WNL, you never looked, you didn't check it, or you're so bad at it, you just give everybody the same one. Don't do it. A normal would be a systolic pressure of 120 or below, a diastolic of 80 or below. We talked about those numbers and what they mean, systolic and diastolic. You sure you just say that so I'll shut up? Okay, I'm just checking. The, so the systolic pressure represents what then? It's just beating? Which specifically? 
Yeah, the left ventricle, when it contracts, the 180, uh, 120 represents that. What does uh, the diastolic represent? Mm -hmm. The left ventricle is filling up. Yes, it's filling at that time. It represents the pressure that remains in the vessel after that big pulse wave moves by. That's what the diastolic is. The diastolic period represents the filling of the blood, a uh, filling of the heart. Uh, this is what? Sphagnomanometer. That is the blood pressure cuff. You don't have to know that. It's just a weird thing. When you place it on, you need to have a space up here. It should be on the upper two-thirds of the arm. And when you put this on, you want to make sure that it's fitted to your patient. If it wraps too far around, then it's going to change your, uh, it's going to give you an incorrect reading. If it's too tight, I mean, it doesn't reach around far enough, it's also going to give you an incorrect reading. So it needs to fit there. Okay, you ready? Define auscultation. Okay, come on, y'all. Get with it. Embarrassing me. <coughs> we auscultate the lungs. We're listening to the lungs. Auscultation is listening. Killing me. Now, you can auscultate a blood pressure. And I know I heard in another class recently that a preceptor was teaching the students how to auscultate. You don't need to learn to auscultate the blood pressure. You want to try to get a palpated, what does palpate mean? Feel. Feel. You want to get a palpated blood pressure almost all the time. The only time you need to auscultate a blood pressure is when you absolutely have <coughs> no ability to hear it. Then you may... Uh, Palpate it. Did I say all that right? You're going to palpate it. Don't auscultate. I want you to palpate. I want you to auscultate. Don't palpate. I'm losing my mind. You're going to auscultate all the time. You'll palpate only if you can't hear it. When you palpate it, you know, when you're listening to where you lose that sound, what you're doing here is you're feeling for when the pulse returns. So you pump it up really hard. And you actually occlude. Remember what occlude means? You close that off. You actually occlude the blood flow, and so you don't feel a pulse down here because there's no blood flowing. As you start releasing that, and the number starts ticking down like this, when you get to the point that this opens up enough that the blood flows through, you'll feel a pulse. Once you feel that pulse, you look at the number, and that's going to be your palpated blood pressure. And we... <coughs> Note it like this. Because you do not get a diastolic pressure here. And sometimes the diastolic pressure can be very important. So you want to get the diastolic pressure anytime you can. Only time you want to get a palpated blood pressure is if you absolutely can't get an auscultated pressure. Okay? You're going to um, put the diaphragm of your stethoscope over your brachial artery. It varies a little bit on everybody. So I always want to make sure I can hear it before I spend a lot of time working on this whole blood pressure thing. So I'll pump it up to maybe 100, and I'll listen. You should hear that pulsing. Remember? That's what we do. We pump it up until we don't hear it anymore. So I'm pumping it up to about 100. If I don't hear it, I'm going to pump it up a little bit more. As long as you're hearing it, you keep pumping it up until you don't hear it anymore. Then you give it a little bit of more squeeze, and then you start going back down. But you need to make sure you can hear it going up so that you know when you, uh, when you lose it. Okay. Y'all been over. Greg covered this pretty well, didn't he? Everybody was here during that. But nobody missed that day. Vital signs or that? I didn't think so. Okay, talked about the, that. Uh, palpation, I talked about that. Good for me. Okay. Pediatric patients, 
we don't even bother getting a blood pressure on kids that are younger than three because it doesn't tell you anything. Remember the little graph I drew for you? They compensate, 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 then they fall off the cliff. So, so what if you check the pulse? Check a, you check a blood pressure right here and it's all good and 30 seconds later he falls off the cliff. So that blood pressure doesn't tell you anything about how your patient's doing. If you check it down here, I don't need a blood pressure to know what's going on here, right? You can look at that kid because he's probably unconscious. So blood pressure doesn't really tell us anything in kids that are under three. We just don't take a time with it. Um, if you had nothing else to do, the kid's completely stable, you're just like passing some time, then take a blood pressure on them. But if you need it to tell you if the patient's in serious condition or not, you are wasting your time. Temperature, yeah, right. I, I've never worked anywhere except in the hospital where they take a temperature. Maybe you guys might do that, I don't know. Usually you can get a pretty good idea by touching your patient's skin if they're feverish or not. You know, didn't your mom do that too? Yeah. You have a fever, honey? They do that. You don't have a fever. Get to school. But you can usually tell if they're warm or cold. Pulse oximetry, we talked about that. That's checking your oxygen saturation. And what is the saturation? <laughs> um, but what it does is it's looking to see how concentrated stuff is on the hemoglobin molecule. And I say stuff because most of the time we're looking for oxygen attached to the hemoglobin, but sometimes something else may get on there. What would that be? Carbon monoxide. If car carbon monoxide has a much greater affinity or attraction to, carbon to the hemoglobin molecule, they're like a magnet and they're drawn like this. Whereas hemoglobin and oxygen kind of goes, oh, okay, I think I'll get on here. So if you've got carbon monoxide in the area, it's going to actually knock oxygen off the hemoglobin and attach itself. So what's happening here is it's the uh, pulse oximeter is shining a little uh, ultraviolet light through there, and it can detect how concentrated stuff is on the hemoglobin molecule. If it looks full, it's going to say, man, it's 98%. If it's not so full, it may say it's 80%. So it's looking for oxygen. Sometimes it may detect carbon monoxide. So if you've got a patient that's uh, obviously in respiratory distress, he looks poorly perfused. You know, he's kind of maybe purplish or bluish around the gills, altered mental status. And you put this on his finger and it says it's 99%. He's not very well perfused, is he? He's not very well oxygenated, but his pulse oximeter says it's like 100%. You're going to suspect carbon monoxide in, in the presence of other things. But just recognize that it could be <coughs> carbon monoxide and not oxygen on there. You do need to know these figures here because you will get these on National Registry. Mild hypoxia is 91 to 95. So if you've got a patient with a pulse oximetry reading of 96%, that's considered normal. And in most cases, with 96 or above, you don't even put them on oxygen. What would have to be in place for you to put a patient on oxygen and they had a pulse ox of 98%? I told you this last night. Before yeah, if they're severe, uh, if they have severe chest pain, if they've got any critical findings, then even if it says 98%, you're going to put them on oxygen. If you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning and they show a 99%, they're getting oxygen. So just a normal patient with a 97, 96% pulse ox, they're okay. But if they've got respiratory distress, chest pain, you know, any severe pain anywhere, then uh, you're going to go ahead and put them on oxygen. Significant or moderate hypoxia, hypoxia is 86% to 90. If it's 85 and below, they are doing very poorly. If you had some old guy, uh, a homeless guy outside, it's January, he's leaning up against the, the overpass on the interstate, and you put a pulse oximeter on him, and you got a reading of 83%. What are you thinking? It may not be accurate. He may be cold. Uh, you know, if he's been sitting on the ground, how's he losing body heat? What do you call that? <coughs> if, he's, if he's 
He's sitting on the ground. He's leaning up against the pose. <coughs> How's he losing body heat? Conduction. Y'all got to work on this a little bit. I think we just, we were just talking about No, that was the day class. Okay, yeah. that's conduction. I'll cut you guys some slack. Thank you. Okay, accuracy of reading can be affected by if they're shocky or hypothermic, they're not circulating well. So it's not going to be uh, indicative. Carbon monoxide uh, may not be indicative. If they've got nail polish or if they're anemic, meaning they don't have enough hemoglobin or they don't have enough red blood cells, then they're going to look like they've got low pulse ox reading. And they may have low oxygen level. So there's some things that may affect the reading. All right, I got a star up here. Y'all ready? Which of the following represents moderate hypoxia? I said y'all paying attention 10 seconds ago. Come on. Chop, chop. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Are some of you, like, talking or sleeping back there? I know I had 15 earlier, or even 16. Somebody's quit playing. Good work. Moderate hypoxia. Do you remember what the levels were? 95. Okay. Let's see how we did. Okay, some of you missed that one. 92% would be what? Mild. Okay. Blood glucose. We haven't done that yet in the lab, but we're going to. Uh, checking a patient's blood glucose is very important. Any patient with altered mental status, you have to check their blood glucose level. Because if they don't have enough circulating blood sugar, they have altered mental status, uh, that can kill them. So checking their blood glucose may help you identify a patient, of course, that's hypoglycemic, but it may also point you to a patient that's hyperglycemic. And that's probably one of the biggest problems today. People don't realize that they're diabetic. They're so used to high circulating blood sugar, they don't recognize the signs and symptoms. And that can be a killer, because what I tell you about glucose? Did I tell you the N word? Not here. It's necrotic. Did we have that conversation? No. All right. Why are y'all looking like the day class? They're all girls. It's kind of weird. Anyway. You always want to get a blood glucose. Anybody with the altered mental status? I was teasing. Anybody with the altered mental status, they get a sugar stick. We're going to do that in class. Hopefully we'll do that next week. We don't have to call med control in order to do a glucose stick. Some states they do. So, good. You get to do it. <coughs> now, when you do this, uh, you know what, I'm just going to teach that in the lab. You want to make sure you clean the finger well. Stick it fast. We'll do that. We'll do that later. Normal levels for blood glucose, it should be, here it says from 60 to 80. Usually it kind of mirrors um, our pulse rate. 60 to 100 is considered normal. Anything over 120 and up, you're, you're getting into hyperglycemia. Anything below 60 is hypoglycemia. Y'all know those terms, hyper and hypo. So if we check everybody's blood sugar in here, it's probably going to be on the low side because you haven't eaten. It'll probably be between, yeah, between 60 and 100 most likely, I hope. Okay, vital signs for kids. I'm not going to make you memorize the different pediatric vital signs, but say a two-year-old, is his heart rate going to be faster or slower than yours? Faster. Is his blood pressure going to be higher or lower? Hmm. Higher or lower? It's usually lower. Yeah, their blood pressure is lower. should be, anyway. Is their respiratory rate faster or slower? <coughs> faster. Yeah, their lungs are little. Yeah. Here we go. Vital signs, vital signs, vital signs. Don't leave yet. We're here till 9, remember? You've got to know what the normal parameters are for all the vital signs. If you don't know what's normal, you won't recognize abnormal. That does make sense. Yes? What you say normal for my glucose level again? 60 to 100. I heard 80 to 120 and 130. I know it. You know, that's why I just broaden out the range. It's like any lab test that you take. 
Uh, have you ever got, gone to the doctor and they check your lab results and you'll always see, it'll tell you what the normal range is. It'll say what yours is and it'll say the normal range. Because every lab sets what their own parameters are. Same thing with this. For people that are known diabetics, a 60 is probably low for them. I'll be looking for an 80 from those guys. But for a normal person without a diagnosis of diabetes, 60 is okay. We don't usually get many people falling out at 60. And 100 is okay. Even, you know, the parameters here even said, what's 80, what did it say, 60 to 80? And then it said over 120. Well, that didn't make sense. What about the 80 to 120? So, yeah, 60 to 100 is usually within normal limits. You're probably not going to see anything exact on a test that says those limits. If it says 57, we know that's hypoglycemic. If it says 200, we know that's hyperglycemic. I don't mean to interrupt, but you didn't pass around that roll. Oh! <laughs> Yeah, I'd go back and mark it myself. <laughs> is that is that your problem too over there? Ma'am, yeah. Okay, that's all right. Put it on. Let's keep going here. I'm not in a rush. They pay me till nine o'clock. Okay, how often should you repeat vital signs? Everybody, every five minutes. If they're stable, you can do it every fifteen minutes. If they're unstable, you're looking at about every five minutes. And sometimes it may be sooner than that. You know, if you've got a patient with a difficult blood pressure, you may take that frequently. You know, if you've got a patient with a cardiac issue, you may be checking his pulse regularly. they got respiratory problems, you may be checking that much more frequently. So a minimum of every 15 minutes. If they're unstable, at least every five minutes. You want to look at their vital signs and see if you can identify why they're out of whack. You know, if they're nervous and scared to death, would a pulse of 110 freak you out? Probably not. If it's 140, yeah, you got a problem. So see if there's some other reason for their vital signs being out of whack. Why should you take vital signs more than once? Trending, yeah. You're checking the trend. Are they getting better or are they getting worse? Later on in the semester, I'm going to give you sets of vital signs where you're going to have to identify who's worse and who's better. That, that's kind of fun to do. How should you react when the blood pressure monitor gives a reading that is extremely different from the previous one? Uh, one key here is this blood pressure monitor. Those automatic blood pressure monitors are notoriously inaccurate. So you always want to get at least your first blood pressure yourself where you auscultate it. If you come in behind another crew, if you come in behind the volunteer fire department or first responders and they tell you the blood pressure was whatever they tell you, you want to check it yourself. I don't mean to be rude, but you want to check it yourself. Uh, you don't know that they haven't made one up. Or you don't know that it didn't change dramatically in that five or ten minutes before you got to them. So you always want to check it yourself. Now, if you want to, in between every other time, use a blood pressure monitor, a uh, automatic one, that's okay. But just know that they're not accurate and uh, you need to work on your own skills. When you're out in the field, I want you to get real blood pressures. If the medic says here, just or the nurse says here, just use this automatic one and say, well, my teacher told me I had to like, get a real one. So you have to get a real one. I'm going to pass these around too. Oh, that's fast. The end, the end is near. It's not here yet. Oh, that's near. That's messed up. That's yeah, that's that was there. really rough. <laughs> Sometimes a patient's heart. Oh, stop. Yeah, yeah. It's still near. Sometimes a patient's heart will have an electrical problem and beat more than 200 times a minute. Why is the pulse so weak? with a patient with a pulse of 200. Yeah, it doesn't have enough blood in there to really get a big, strong pulse. Yeah, so it's going to feel really weak because there's no blood in there. Uh, okay, what's today? Thursday. Thursday. So what happens tomorrow? Friday. We don't come to school. That is right. So Tuesday, 